I'm excited. What, what happened today is great. I told Mike, don't worry about it. It's yeah. good. It's like makes us like, okay. You can, you can start the stream. Okay, you want to check it on your phone because... Yeah, I'll check it on my phone. I don't want that. Watch yours. In case you want to... It says live. Like I usually do. Oh. Or like... Now I need my clicker. Did anybody see my clicker? <laughs> oh, here, found it. Is that a new associate from them, the young girl there? Work so, I think so. I think so. Eh? So we're trying to broadcast everything. It's great. Yeah, it's Without the mic or with the mic? You have my mic here, right? Oh, One, two. Check, check. And order, order your meals to go. Is that okay with you? Or you can order, or order it in ch whatever, however you want. You can order, you guys figure out. I'll have, Mic work now? Yeah, wow. It's working good. <laughs> you hear me loud and clear? Yeah. yeah. So look, I'm Guys, gonna go in front of this. Watch what here, you're saying, okay? And announce what we're doing. It's broadcast okay? live. Cut to this here. Okay. Broadcast live. Watch what I'm saying. I don't know what it's saying. Okay. No, it's public. Oh. So we don't care. You can show me. Let's take. You can show him. You can show me. Let's go. Bill, be careful, be careful. In Beverly Hills, California, here we are at the study club meeting. Uh, Dr. Zeef Simon uh, is doing a lecture on aesthetic crown lengthening. How to design soft tissue around your restoration. So you do veneers, crowns, anterior restorations. Right, uh, directly down to the portion of my mouth. So what's going to be interesting about this lecture is Dr. Simon is going to go over how he treatment plans his patients 
when it comes to aesthetic and clown the software that he uses. Notice how he talks to his patients and on what he does. Final result. Uh, how, how's it going? Are you feeling it or no? Test, test. We're still testing here. Yeah. Picking up now. Somehow when you it. wasn't picking up. Okay. So if, in case you didn't hear me before, we're here live in Beverly Hills. Dr. is doing a lecture on. So, or maybe test one, test two, one, test two. Test, test. Yeah, we're good now. Yeah, cool. <laughs> That's fine. We good? Hello everyone, we changed the mic. Uh, Dr. Rashad Ryman here. We are live from Beverly Hills, California. Uh, behind me, there's a lot of uh, doctors from uh, the Beverly Hills and Los Angeles area. You know, passionate individuals that like to do great quality work. And we are meeting here this evening uh, to, uh, you know, witness a lecture that Dr. Zeef Simon is gonna give on aesthetic crown lengthening. Um, you know, changing, as a general dentist I'm speaking, having the eye and the ability to manipulate gum tissue is going to give you so much more power to your final outcome, especially if you're doing cosmetic cases. So this lecture is important in the sense that you'll get a look into how Dr. Zeef Simon thinks through aesthetic crown lengthening cases, how he sets up his cases, how he treatment plans them, and he's right here next to me right now. Hey, <laughs> hey Rashad, what, what were you saying? I was, I was, I was, you know, introducing the, you know, our event tonight, and uh, and and mentioning that you're going to be going over how you actually treatment plan your cases, right? Yeah. So. Tonight's lecture, or it's a, more of a presentation, mm -hmm. is about how to create aesthetic soft tissue. So I'm going to fo be focusing on two major things. One, how to create symmetry and how to remove excess. Yeah. Which, is, and I'm going to talk about the four types of patients that need this type of treatment. I'm going to talk about the four types of diagnoses that cause excess tissue. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about a four-step communication system, how to communicate to the patient what they need and how to get high case acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be talking about the four steps of aesthetic crown lengthening. So the theme is four, it just so happened. And it's, uh, you know, I'm excited. It's new material and uh, a really simple and interesting thing, a way to look at It seems to be complex to a lot of dentists, but um, I think it's, this will be demystified tonight. I'm super excited and I was telling everyone that this takes any general dentist's ability to the next level. Because if you're doing cosmetic cases, having the eye to, you know, trim the soft tissue properly, whether you need, you know, hard tissue removal of, or only soft tissue, will, will allow them to have a lot better results for their final cases. So thanks for, you know, being here and sharing this with the world, Dr. Simon. Thank you. And always a pleasure to be with you. I'm excited, vice versa. Thank right. you guys, we'll see you in a few minutes. Enjoy. So, sorry, the recording. No, please do not. Oh, good. 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 Good.
Of course not. Of course not. Thanks for reminding me. We'll do it. Of course we'll do it. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. How are you guys? Nice to have you. Thank you for, for uh, coming to our uh, presentation. Uh, Ari and myself, always excited to see you. And we're going to have a great evening together. We are joined by uh, the internet community. Uh, we are broadcasting this live on Facebook, YouTube, and on another page. So we'll have a couple hundred people more with us. So just ignore the cameras and pretend they're not there. So I'm going to get started. So again, welcome. Uh, on behalf of Ari and myself, uh, between Ari and me, we have 60 years of experience. And our practice has been there for over 40 years. So what we're going to show you is a small part of what we do. And we don't do it all by ourselves. We have great staff. We have great assistants. Our assistants are actually uh, published authors. So we had each assistant write a book about a topic that has to do with assistant, assistance. Because we want to teach not only dentists, but we want to make dentists better in everything. And a great part of it is great assisting. So here's Patty talking about the assistant setup, Lily, about how to manage patients in surgery, and we have our very own Jose who wrote a book about how to manage complications from an assistant perspective. Show me one assistant in the world that wrote a book. I'm so proud of them. So uh, if you want copies, and we can have them signed, just let me know. Okay, <laughs> excellent. And this is the whole staff, uh, recent photo, and when you talk to our office, you're probably talking to Nazi or Michelle. So behind this, uh, what we think is an oiled machine, 
there are real people that are passionate about what they do, like Ari and myself. Uh, we love coming to work every day, and we love treating your patients, and we love sharing what we do. And this is part of what we're doing tonight. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about how to create aesthetic soft tissues around the natural dentition, but also around restorations. There's really no difference. What we're trying to do is to get the ideal soft tissue by reshaping and creating symmetry. And that is done by two things, two ways. By reducing tissue and by grafting. And rather than bog you down and show you 50 cases and everybody gets confused, I'm going to focus only on tissue excess, on tissue reduction, which is very important for your restorative work. For veneers, crowns in the aesthetic zone, you want the tissue to be symmetrical and you want the teeth proportions to be appropriate. And in this presentation, I'll be talking to you about how to remove the right amount of tissue, how to deal with tissue excess and how to create symmetry. If I can teach you one thing, I'm going to be sleeping pretty well tonight. And I usually sleep very well, so I don't, I don't want to change that. I'm going to talk to you about the four types of patients that can benefit from this type of treatment and also how to diagnose them. So when you talk to your patients initially, before you refer them or if you perform the procedure yourself, you need to be able to diagnose them and you need to be able to communicate with them properly. Each type of patient has its own way of communication. I'm going, going to give you the exact script that I use myself. And you can adapt it or not, but it's, it's been working for us for 60 years combined. And I'm also going to talk to you about what not to do. What are the things that can get us into trouble? And I'll share this with you. And of course, I'm going to be interacting with you and talking to you about uh, your questions and your own concerns and your own problems. And we're going to be fielding some questions from the online community uh, mm -hmm. through these guys here back, Michael and his brother. And I'm excited. So I'm going to get started with uh, our first patient. And we often get patients come to see us from all walks of life. They can be accountants, lawyers, dentists, regular people, actors, singers, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But very often, we have a, a patient for, like uh, Grant here, who is a very, uh, a very manly man. So he's like a bachelor type TV show um, star. But when he smiles, he doesn't look so manly anymore. And I wanted to share with you, uh, first of all, his smile, the way, the way he smiles and the shape of his teeth and his gingival display. But I also wanted to share with you what he, how he explained the problem. So uh, Grant was part of a, a separate project we did in the office. Uh, we filmed and broadcast his whole surgery, start to finish live and also in a recording later on. And I interviewed him for about one minute before the surgery and I wanted you just to listen to the words and what he says because I personally learned a lot from, uh, from these words. So let's uh, keep quiet for one minute and try to listen to Grant. Small device. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And that guides us exactly where we want to get down the studio. Yeah. And then we'll, you know, we'll walk you through this whole process. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks for the confidence. Yeah, okay. of course. Let's okay. get, get started in a few minutes. All right. Excellent. So thanks for watching that. So what did we learn from this video except for not chewing gum when you're on camera? I mean, I always have gum in my mouth for some reason. The things that Grant said were, when I talk, you can't really see a lot of my teeth. When I smile, my teeth are even and straight, but, when, but they are smaller than the other features of my face. And I want it all to match up. And what I loved about that, it summed up exactly why we're doing it. It summed up the, and for, since I graduated 20 years ago, there were different definitions of a perfect smile, and we are bombarded by, uh, you know, different gurus and uh, very great people that try to formulate the smiles and create templates. Mm -hmm. And everybody should fit inside this template. And in reality, what happens when the smile becomes too perfect, it loses its characteristics from a teeth perspective and a, and, a, and a soft tissue perspective. And very often, these simulations look horrible. And everybody becomes the same uh, template. Doesn't look good. The perfect smile is a denture. And a lot of people walk around with teeth that look like dentures. And it's not a great thing. And it's not a criticism. I think there's a great shift right now to look into perfect imperfections. And not to make everything perfectly the same because it doesn't look 100% real. And this is where many dentists fail, dentists and periodontists. They base their treatment only on a golden proportion in those templates. That's what guides them. They don't take into account the changes in the incisal ledge position, performing a crown lengthening, not thinking that the crown lengthening uh, is affected not just by the soft tissue, it's affected also by where the incisal ledge needs to be. Another reason dentists fail is because of gingivectomies that are very close to bone, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit as well to avoid trouble. And sometimes removing too little bone and not focusing on reshaping the bone. So there are some reasons, and, and these, are, these are things that will make dentists fail. And one of the biggest problems is perfectionism. Perfectionism is a, is a is, I, I see it as a dangerous state of mind, that you know, the, the world is not perfect, and it's a, uh, it's, I think it's the worst form of self-abuse. But I found a great, uh, I think it's great, definition for perfectionism. And I'm going to read it out to you. Now, it's a little bit philosophical. And you may have to think about it for a few minutes. But when I learned this definition of perfectionism, and about the fact that some patients tell us, you know, he's a perfectionist. They mean it as a compliment. But perfectionism is a disease. And it, it's preventing forward momentum. It's preventing you from moving forward. It's holding you back. So what is perfectionism according to this definition? Perfectionism is trying to fool the world into believing something about yourself that you currently don't believe about yourself. Okay, so I'm not going to try and explain it. Just think about it. You're trying to fool the world in believing something about yourself that you don't even believe about yourself. Okay? So I cured myself from perfectionism years ago. There's a way to get out of it. And it's very simple. You can do it over a weekend. And maybe in a different lecture, we'll talk about it. So let's talk about the gummy smile. Excessive, gum, excessive gingival display. Not all gummy smiles are the same. There are different types of patients. There are different types of diagnoses. There are combos. And you need to be aware of it. Whether you're performing crown lengthening or not, you need to be aware of what is causing the soft tissue excess and what's the patient type. And let's start with types of patients. There are four types of patients that can benefit from tissue reduction. One type of patient is a patient that is usually very young, that has short, tiny little teeth that look square. Sometimes the width is larger than the height. And they don't need much. They need tissue reduction. And all we're doing, we're exposing the natural enamel. And these are the most beautiful cases because you're exposing virgin enamel. So the patient comes in with virgin teeth. They're relatively young. That's why I call this type of patient a young virgin. 
okay? Please don't tell your patient you're this young virgin that Ziv talked about, but just for you to remember. A second type of patient, and I'll give you the example. So here's the example, natural enamel, the incisal edge is a proper, we have excess tissue because of a certain diagnosis I'm going to be talking about. And all we need to do is remove excess tissue and bone and we'll have the right tooth proportion or teeth proportion. And the teeth are virgin and they will stay virgin. The second type of patient, I call him the pre-restorative. These are patients that have excess tissue and we need to remove some tissue also need to restore them. They have a tooth malpositioning or they have uh, tetracycline staining or they have wear and it's a pre-restorative procedure. And here's an example. A patient that has excessive tissue because of a diagnosis I'm going to be explaining in a second and she will need soft tissue removal but also restorative treatment with veneers and this is her simulation. So this is our pre-restorative treatment. What is a third type of patient? Type of patient that is relatively old, and by the way, some of you guys may recognize your patients here, because our, our patients um, are coming from you guys, so you'll see them here. And this is a patient that is relatively old or older, and has problems with the occlusion, teeth malpositioning, tooth migration, a lot of wear and tear. And I call this type of patient old and worn okay just don't call them old and worn okay but this is a type of patient that will, will present to your office and these were the three types of patients that we've been seeing for uh, almost 20 years and Ari for 40 years but we have one more type of patient and this is a patient that needs aesthetic crown lengthening or tissue reduction but also actually I'm going to show you first what is a, a worn patient, okay, good, good work, whoever restored this case. Uh, this is the type of patient that needs tissue reduction, but also has an implant or implants, which adds another level of complexity because when we reduce tissue next to an implant, that's going to be a big problem, okay? So remember those four types of patients, and I'm going to quiz you during this lecture about those types of patients, okay? And if you don't know the answer, I'm going to help you. Okay? It's easy. So here's a patient that has an implant in the number nine position, and the implant stayed ankylotic over the years. The maxillary uh, underwent some maxillary growth. The other teeth moved apically, uh, moved coronally or incisally, and we need to do some crown lengthening, and we can't, we can't touch the implant. It adds another level of complexity. I'm going to show you a couple of cases. Okay? That's a, that's a problem. And also, I'm going to, going to give you some tips in regards to how to place implants or how to plan implants when it comes to the eruption. You actually have to reduce the bone, which is counterintuitive. And we have to bury those implants much deeper than you would no normally do. So the four types of patients, we have our young virgin, who is a young patient with intact teeth, no, no future treatment. We have a pre-restorative. We have a patient that has the worn dentition, we call them not in their face, old and worn, and we have our implant patient. Okay, these are the four types. Now, don't get hung up on the patient's age. I know I gave you some guidelines about the age, but it's not necessarily the age. You can be young and worn as well. It all depends what you did to your teeth. It all depends on the time span that it took for this, this uh, problem to occur. So you know the types of patients, now we need to know what's causing the excess. And I'm going to share with you, and actually today's theme is four. Everything is going to be fours. It'll be easy for you to remember. And does anybody speak Chinese? Chinese? Don't you work in Alhambra? <laughs> okay, so we're not going to talk about what it means in, in Chinese. Basically, if you go to Malaysia or China, there's no fourth floor. It's just one of the worst words ever. Okay, so there are four reasons for tissue excess. We have delayed eruption, we have compensatory eruption, we have vertical maxillary excess, and we have the hypermobile lip. Keep it simple. Okay, and I'm going to explain each and every one of those, and it's very simple to understand. And also, when you come back to your office tomorrow, 
and you see patients with excess tissue, you'll start to think about what type of patient and what's the reason causing the excess. Keep it really simple. So what's delayed eruption? If you think about the eruption process, when teeth erupt, there are two phases. One is called active eruption, when the tooth erupts from the jaw. And it stops when? It stops when it, it reaches the opposing dentition. That's the only time it stops. And when does active eruption stop? Anybody? Never. It never stops. Because if you have, you're missing an opposing tooth, the tooth or teeth have a, an eruptive mechanism. They, they'll keep erupting no, no matter what. And then the second phase of eruption is called passive eruption, and that's when the soft tissue retracts. And sometimes those, those two processes never happen. What's the end result? You have a tooth that looks short, but actually there's excess bone and soft tissue, and that's called delayed eruption, or delayed active and passive eruption. When I say delayed, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It's not just delayed and it'll happen next week. It will never happen. That's just how we call it. How do we diagnose it? Very simple. Look at the incisal ledges. If the incisal ledges are intact, and sometimes you'll even see a, a remnant of the mammalons, and you see a short tooth with no zenith, no anatomical shape of the gingiva, completely flat or a very small curvature, that's delayed eruption 99.9%. .9%. So you already have a diagnostic skill you can utilize right away. Is that clear? So no zenith. No zenith and intact incisal edges. Okay, I'm going to ask you now. What patient is this? What type of patient? I'm sorry? A young version. Type. It's a young, ver I mean, dentally speaking. One. One. Good answer. Okay, so this is a, a patient with intact dentition, with virgin teeth that will stay virgin. All we need to do is remove some soft tissue. Here's another case. Look at this. Look at the incisal edges. Are they worn? They're worn. Excellent. So they're worn, but look at the soft tissue. Pretty flat. No zenith. This is a combination. A combination of delayed eruption, but also compensatory eruption because there's some attrition. Okay? And it's important to know the difference. Okay, so this type of patient, let's call them the pre-restorative because they will need some veneer or some aesthetic work. And very often, here's another clue. A lot of those delayed eruption patients have mountains of bone, excess bone, tori, exostosis. Very simple to see right in here. And I'll show you a bit later what's hiding underneath and what, what do we need to do with it. Okay? Now, delayed eruption can be localized. It doesn't have to be on all of the teeth. It can be localized on one tooth for whatever reason. It can be on two teeth. It can be all of the teeth. Okay? But again, look at the gingival margin. It looks pretty flat. It can be in the non-aesthetic zone. So when you examine your patient, look everywhere. It can be the low incisors. And sometimes they need to be calling them because... Some of us think in low incisors don't matter for aesthetics. They do. Patients show their upper teeth when they smile, but they show the lower teeth when they talk. And the older you get, the lower teeth you show. So molars, if you ever prepped a lower first or second molar, and once you're done with the prep, the tooth disappeared, it's because of delayed eruption. And then you need functional chronolengthening. Okay, that's pretty common. Okay, you need to be able to diagnose that. What is compensatory eruption? Compensatory eruption is when the teeth go through attrition. And in compensation, the teeth start to slowly erupt with the soft tissue. And the best example is somebody who has, has worn their teeth to nothing or almost nothing, but they didn't lose the vertical. How come they didn't lose the vertical? Is because the teeth kept erupting and kept the dimensions of the ridge. So you'll see short teeth with incisal wear. And that's pretty obvious here, incisal wear. And sometimes you'll see the Z. That means it's purely or mostly compensatory eruption, but sometimes it's a combination. Call them combo cases, delayed eruption and compensatory. So don't, again, don't let the age confuse you. Don't think that you know, the uh, old and worn patient has to have that, or the young patient has to be a virgin dentally. So, Look at the incisal edge, look at the gingival margin, 
and look at other clues that can tell you about the diagnosis. So why does it matter, actually? Why does it matter if the patient has delayed eruption or compensatory eruption? What's the big deal? So, uh, Gaby, Dr. Koskov is saying one involves tissue, one involves bone. Uh, it could be both. It could be both. So you can have compensatory eruption that obviously involves soft tissue and bone. Sometimes the bone doesn't follow for some reason. And delayed eruption, sometimes the bone is where it's supposed to be. It's just a soft tissue. So, uh, we, but we're pretty close. So when you have delayed eruption and you complete the procedure, all you're exposing is the coronal part of the tooth, the, the, the complete exposure of the crown. When we talk about compensatory eruption, at the end of the procedure, we will expose the CJ and beyond. We'll expose root surface. So that would require restorative treatment. So for delayed eruption, I call it expose and enjoy. That's it. Simple. Expose and enjoy. With compensatory eruption, most of these cases will require restorative treatment. And we have to talk to the patient about it as well. And there's going to be an ugly duckling stage until they get their restorations. Okay, so keep this in mind. It's very important for your treatment planning. The third diagnosis is vertical maxillary excess. That's a skeletal deformity. That's when the maxilla is larger than the norm in the vertical dimension. And they can have normal teeth proportions. They can have delayed eruption in VME. They can have compensatory eruption in VME. But it's very obvious that there's a lot of gingival display, excess tissue, because of a skeletal component. And if we're going to crown lengthening or remove some tissue and bone, uh, God help this patient. They look horrible. One clue is an abnormal rest position. So their lips are incompetent. The rest they'll expose a lot of their teeth in rest. And that's one of the clues. And, and it's pretty obvious what it is. The last diagnosis that gets overlooked many, many times, just because uh, all of us, including myself, we, we don't always have patience in terms of dedicating the time. It's called the hypermobile lip. And this is when a patient is smiling. There's a very strong muscle pull. And I take those photographs and ask the patient to smile a little bit more. And a lot of us will stop here. And then, you know, I just <coughs> pull out the, 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 I try to be as funny as I can. And you get them smile even more. And you can see those muscles are stretching. This, these are patients that have a normal rest position, but when they smile, they have a lot of gingival display. Again, their, their teeth proportions are pretty normal. Pretty normal. There the, the may not be a papilla in here, which is a separate issue, but this is mostly because of a, a strong muscle pull. And these are the four diagnoses, and they're combos, so don't get confused. If somebody is delayed eruption, doesn't mean that they don't have VME or vice versa. Okay? You can have combinations. And again, I'm going to be testing you about some of the case. So let's practice. Let's practice. Let's look at this patient. Let's, let's pick, on, pick on Phil. So we have a patient with worn dentition, uh, relatively old in her early 70s or late 60s, uh, occlusal changes, tooth migration. What type of patient? Old and worn. Old and worn. Okay. It happens. Uh, she also has, she's been taking tetracycline for a long time, so you can start seeing the staining of the bone underneath. That, re that is revealed during surgery. And this patient will need soft tissue resection and also a restoration. So what's the diagnosis? What's the diagnosis? Let's look at the incisal edges and the, soft, and the gingival margin. There's no, it's pretty flat. The incisal edge is worn. So here we have a case of combination of delayed eruption and compensatory eruption. Okay? Don't, don't confuse you, but we have to know in the back of our minds that once we do the procedure, we will have to also follow up with restoration. So we do our due diligence with uh, diagnostic wax-ups, the surgery, the restorative treatment, and we can bring this patient to be, to look less old and worn. And that's really our goal. Now let's do one more. One more. Uh, this is choose proportion gauge. I recommend you get one of those kits from, 
forgot from whom, I think from uh, Euphredi. And this basically measures the tooth proportion. So if the tooth width is between those red line, according to the proportion, it should be as long as the red line. And it's a very important tool, but it, remember I warned you about perfectionism and about following template and, and golden standards. 20 years ago, all we talked about is the golden proportion. I, I don't think you hear this word ever again in, in, in aesthetic lectures. I think uh, we can attest to it right now. This proportion gauge works as long as the incisal edge doesn't change. If the incisal ch edge is changing, whether lengthening or shortening, the whole proportion is off. So why did we use this guide? So what is the diagnosis here? Anybody? Let's look at the incisal edges. They look pretty intact to me. And let's look at the gingival margin. We don't see a zenith. It's pretty flat. So that's delayed eruption. Delayed eruption, very simple. All we need to do is expose the natural enamel, which is again a beautiful thing to, to perform that. But this patient's smile is different. <coughs> what are we seeing here? We're seeing two things. We're seeing excess tissue because of vertical maxillary excess, but also some hypermobile lip. So this, this is a combo. Delayed eruption, vertical maxillary excess, and hypermobile lip. And the more you in, engrave those diagnoses and patients ty patient types in your head, the better it is. Uh, I can tell you that after doing this for a long time, uh, when a patient just sits in the chair, I, in my head, I can already tell, this is a, this is a young virgin, that it, it, already, it already works, so it's very important. So this, ty this type of patient, young virgin patient with delayed eruption, vertical maxillary ex excess, and also hypermobile lips. So we have four types of patients and four diagnoses. Any questions about that so far? All clear? Excellent. If we have any questions from the online community, just um, ask me in the back. Now, each type of patient has their own personality, their own wishes, desires, the things they expect, the things they're afraid of. <clears throat> and it's important to know how to communicate. And you need to be able to communicate with each and every one differently. Okay, you can't be the same doctor every time. You, can't, you have to be very, very flexible. And that's based on who is sitting in front of you. And that's called psychology. Okay, we need to be psychologists, and it's very important. I'm giving you some tools that are just shortcuts to, to, you know, to becoming a psychologist. So we, we, very, very important to understand that. So I'm going to teach you a four-step communication system that I've been using for a long time. Again, four steps. And this is on top of everything else. So on top of your uh, extra oral, intra oral exam, your com comprehensive workup, your restorative workup, uh, radio radiographic exam, this is on top of it. It's not instead of. And what are the four steps of the system? Step number one, and in my opinion, the most important step that many dentists skip because of uh, lack of time, lack of attention, and really missing the boat here. That's the most important part of the whole treatment is the patient interview. And I'm going to show you what type of key questions I ask. And you must write them down. You have to write them down. You have to document them because you need to use them later on when you communicate. The second step are specific photos that I take for these types of patients. And this is on top of all the other photos you're taking anyhow. Okay? Some of them are, uh, are the same. Some are in addition. The third step is a virtual simulation, extremely important for patient communication, case acceptance, and creating uh, mutual trust. And lastly, your presentation, how you present the finding, how you talk to the patient. It doesn't have to be a whole, we call it a megilla. It doesn't have to be a whole story. The, more, the better you understand the patient, their type of patient, their personality, their desires and wishes, and if you do your due diligence, and it's not difficult, you can complete it in one hour, you can present the findings, you can present your recommendations, and it would be very rare. I'd be very surprised if your patients refuse it. They'll only refuse it for one reason. If they're medically compromised, 
or if they can't afford it. If you can't afford it, you can't, you can't invent money. You've got to really earn it. Okay, but that's why God invented credit cards. Okay, your patients can't afford your treatments. Four-step communication system. Now, throughout this process, there are two levels of communication when you speak to your patient. There is the explicit wavelength. This, these are the things you're saying. These are the things you're saying with your own voice, the words you choose, the sentences you utilize, and how you build up the case talking. There's another wave of communication, another channel, and that's the implicit, and that's what the patient is perceiving you to be. The explicit is what we mostly use. We forget about the implicit. So you want to say and do things and perform procedures and tests and all sorts of documentation methods that will imply that you are the go-to person, that you are the go-to doctor to do this procedure. That instills confidence in the patient. That instills trust. And when you're done, they know, your patient knows that they're in the right practice with the right doctor, with the right treatment. They'll just figure out how they can pay for it. So don't forget about the implicit. So let's start with the interview. So when I talk with the patient, I'm not going to too much into detail. I always ask them, so why are you seeing me? Although I know, I know you gave me those referral cards and we talked on the phone and we got an email. And... I know why they're here, but I want to hear it from them. I want them to voice all these concerns. And there are, there's a list of questions here. For example, what don't you like about your smile? And they say something vague. You say, would you be a little bit more specific? What don't you, what, what don't you like about your gums or your teeth? What do you like about your smile? What are the things that you like? Very important to know. How do you feel about the color of your gums. How do you feel about the, the shape, okay? I'm using the word feel quite a bit. Do you have any old photos you can show me? Or maybe, do you have any favorite actor or some, somebody on television or in the movies that you really like their smile? Would you share that with me? Every statement, every question, every answer from the patient leads to another question by me. So that can take quite a while. It can take 10 minutes. It can take 50 minutes. I spend as long as an hour. And it's, a, it's well worth the investment. And if you think, oh my god, I don't have time for that, it's kind of annoying to ask all of these questions. And who even cares? You know what? The person who cares is your patient. It's like, uh, if you've been to psychotherapy, it's a great experience. Mm -hmm. You just talk about your problems and about what bothers you. It, it, it's the most uplifting thing that you can do. And you're going to press lightly and a little bit hard sometimes on the things that bother the patient. They would love it. And you want to fine tune what bothers them. So they're going to tell you a bunch of things. Like, my gums are showing, I'm all gum. My gums show when I smile, my teeth are short, my teeth are square. They don't match my face, I look like a little girl. We have some actresses in their 30s that get teenage roles. They put them in braces just for movies because they, they have tiny little teeth. They can never play in a, you know, an older woman. So you really want to spend your time and talk to your patient about that. Okay? Very important. So just keep going with those questions and be intentional about them. And it's not bogging the patient. They love it. They want to talk about their problems and what bothers them. And that creates rapport and trust. Spend the time. Okay, so photos. In addition to the photos that you would normally take, these are the specific photos that I recommend. And they're very simple to do. And of course, there are four types of photos. Smile photos, close-ups. Close-ups, I start, always start with the close-up. And I tell the patient, don't worry, it doesn't show your face, just a smile. They feel more comfortable smiling for some reason, most patients. Then full face photos. Then I take photos with absolute measurements, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. I'm using a perio probe. And then I take photos with, that show teeth proportions, with a proportion gauge. These are the four specific photos that are very important to make your case when you talk to your patients. 
So here are simple, everybody does that. Smile photos, lips closed, rest positions, different types of smiling. Take photos from the side. Because when a patient comes in because of gingival display and they tell you, I just want these two, you show them. Your teeth are short, not just in the front. They're short all the way back. And you smile this way. And, and you know what? When you talk to people, there's some people right and left, they're looking at you. So when they see the photos, you don't really have, don't have to say much. So side photos. Then smile photos that will be our basis for our digital simulation. Don't forget about that. And I just keep snapping photos. I run out of battery at the end of the day. I have to change batteries every day. Because I take so many photos. And I think the photos don't always teach us, but they send the message to the patient. I'm in the right place. I'm with the right doctor, I'm with the right team, and they're going to help me. They listen to me. They are studying my smile. Okay? Your smile photos will be, again, used later on in your virtual simulation. I'll show you how simple it is. Three is our measurement with a probe. So I take a photo. Uh, it took me, you know, just, just a balancing act at the beginning just to hold the camera and hold the probe on the other side, or your assistant can hold the probe. And basically what I'm trying to show here is the length of the central incisor. We're looking at an average of 10.5, just kind of in, in the back of your mind. And I'll take another photo with the width as well of mostly the central incisors. And the fourth type of photo is with our proportion gauge. Okay? And when I show this to the patient, I actually don't say anything. And I actually want the patient to ask, what is this cross? Why are you Jewish? You know, it's one, of, it's one of those things. So you want them to ask those questions, okay? So this is called choose proportion gauge. And that's a great diagnostic tool. If we have teeth that are as wide as those red lines, they should be as long as the red line. If we're looking at uh, more or less the range width to height ratio 75 to 80%, more or less. So these are the four types of photos I'm recommending. Once you took your photos, once you did your interview, I do a quick Recap, a quick re review. Don't bog them down now about how great you are with, you know, what great lab you use and what great surgical skills you have and we're going to do this and that. We'll sedate you and you won't have any pain. Don't get there even. We're not there yet. It's a quick recap that basically tells them, I'm studying your smile right now. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking into what's bothering you. And then I'm going to mention three things. The patient's first burning issue, the second and the third. And that's from what you interview the patient about. Always go back to what bothers the patient. You're almost talking to the inside of the patient and they're, they're not even aware of that. And it's not a form of, you know, <laughs> manipulation. It's understanding the patient's psychology. I'm studying your smile, I'm, I'm studying what is bothering you in regards to your short teeth and your excess tissue and how your gum looks a little bit uh, asymmetrical. And you know, looking at those photos, I get what you're saying. I totally get it and you probably can benefit from procedure X, veneers, crown lengthening, whatever it may be, gingivectomy. But before we before we, not you, not me, before I, no, before we make a final decision, let's simulate. Okay, so you're also demonstrating that you're doing your due diligence in taking all the photos, and now is the time for the third part, which is called digital simulation. I'm not gonna show you how it is. I know a lot of you guys wanted to see how it's done. I use a very simple and inexpensive software called Photoshop. You don't have to buy the full version. Photoshop Elements is just short of $100. I have a few videos on YouTube. Just punch in Ziv Simon digital simulation, and you'll see those videos. They show step by step how you can simulate. You don't have to buy software for thousands of dollars and, and get confused. Very simple to do. And all I'm doing, and I like to do it in front of them. So I sit next to them. I put on my glasses on. And I take those photos I just took, 
and I start simulating, and I just do it freehand. And it's a beautiful thing. Your patients are just looking, and they're interested. They're generally interested in what you're doing, and they get it because that's what's bothering them. And then I put the photos side by side. I ask them, what do you think? Sometimes it doesn't come out great. Sometimes it doesn't look well. And that's a good thing as well. Sometimes they don't like the long teeth. So we go through a couple of versions. But the explicit is what I'm talking to them. But the implicit is they know they're in the right place. They know this is not the first patient with this procedure on. Again, you don't have to uh, you know, be you know, the best dentist in the world. You don't have to. You have to do your due diligence. And this is simple stuff and simple communication and simple psychology. Okay? Don't forget about that. So here's my digital simulation. And I like to say, what do you think? Like, not, I'm not telling you, you see, you need that, you need that. No. What do you think? I say, yeah, that looks so much better. Let's look at it from another view. Very important part. Okay? And lastly comes the presentation. Okay, so this is what we are going to do to follow the simulation. Okay? So this is the four-step communication system. Extremely important. I believe that Ari and myself have great case acceptance, knock on wood, and maybe Nazi can attest to it, because we spend the time with the patients and we focus on the psychology. Okay? So try it. Let's talk a little bit about the procedure. Okay? I, I, I showed you what's important. The procedure, that's the technical part of crown lengthening. That's the technical, technical part of the treatment. Not surprisingly, there are four parts for aesthetic crown lengthening. Okay? Any questions so far? I'm going to entertain some questions. Mitch, any questions? No questions? Answers? Okay, excellent. So, yeah. How many patients come to me? Uh, I'd like to say, how many patients come to me uh, just self-referred? Uh, I would say it's 10% uh, versus 90% referred. So we have obviously internal referrals, uh, online referrals, uh, but mostly it's, it's um, referred by you guys. So that's, and, and that's a blessing because the patients come preconditioned and they come already prepped that this is what they need and they're great patients. They're, they're almost pre-qualified. Off the street, off the net, they're not always great. They're not always great. I mean, they could be great. They found you online, but uh, pre-qualification pre is always better. Okay, so what are the four steps of crown lengthening? Very simple. Step number one is our soft tissue reduction. Step number two is a full thickness flap, so we have to reflect the flap and expose the bone. Step number three is bone reduction and reshaping. And step number four is suturing. That's how it is. And there are, of course, the devil is in the details, but for you to remember, these are the different steps. And most of the time, for most cases, they need to have bone reduction and they need to have a flap and we'll talk about when can we do a gingivectomy, when not, what is, what is the role of lasers. So step number one is only soft tissue reduction, and I'm utilizing either a surgical guide, or I'm using the digital simulation or a model, or I'm using, if the incisal edges don't change, I use a proportion gauge. But that's the most part of the procedure. Uh, for all patients, once I'm done with this procedure, I add some anesthetic in the attached gingiva and I actually take my gloves, gloves off and I pull out the mirror and I ask them, you know, take a look, see where we're at. And, and a lot of the patients are, are, they feel it's great already. Okay, we don't send them home right away, but they know that we are on track and, and, and they really like it, see the, the enamel that was exposed before. Step number two is a full thickness flap, so we reflect, reflect the tissue and expose the bone and this is when you start seeing a very typical type of bone for delayed eruption, delayed active eruption. It's thick and it has a, an irregular surface and it's extremely dense. And that's part of the problem. That's why the soft tissues don't retract. 
they get hung up on the bone. We know that the soft tissue follows the bone. So if the bone has an abnormal shape, the, the gum tissue will stay where it's not supposed to be. And that's also the trick, how we can ameliorate it, how we can improve it. If you don't change the bone, you'll get a relapse. Okay, so I, in a way, I want you to be aware when you're doing a gingivectomy, you know, look twice and, and take a look. Does the patient have exostosis, tori? If they do, they need this type of procedure. Okay, so the, sec the, the third step is osseous recontouring. We are reducing vertical levels of bone and changing the shape. That's called osteoplasty. That's more the technical part of it. And you can tell that before and after, it's like a different patient, completely different. This is before osteoplasty. This is after osteoplasty. So we give enough room for the biologic width. We give enough room for your restorations to be away from the bone. And last, lastly is the suturing process. So it is a simple procedure, but it can take an hour and a half. It can take two hours. It, it all depends. It can take 45 minutes. It all depends on what we're finding underneath. I have a question. So the first step when you're removing soft tissue, pretty much to the desired result, what if you have a, a lack of attached ginger by then? Okay, so the question was, in the first step, where you're doing your gingivectomy, what if you don't have attached tissue? Great question. What if you only have mucosa or very little attached tissue? So the answer is, you don't do it. it it's still possible to do, but it's not via resection. It's via apically repositioning the flap. So it's doable. It just adds another level of complexity. That's a great question. So the things that will help you during the surgery is a surgical guide. So for the doctors here that uh, have, have worked with us for many years, uh, you either make the surgical guide or we make it. It doesn't really matter. It's a simple thing. Uh, we utilize the models, we use, utilize the simulation, we use, utilize wax-ups from, from the lab. And based on the wax-up and based on the models, we use a simple suck-down. I like to mark those margins, new margins with pencils. So when you do your suck-down, the pencil transfers to the suck-down. I, you know, I never learned that. It just, we figured out ourselves. And then we have to carefully trim it, and we use it during the surgery. Because in surgery, there's bleeding, there's movement, you lose your orientation. You want to have a stable guide that works and shows you how much to resect. And sometimes we can get fancy. Sometimes we ask our lab technician to make us uh, almost like a snap-on smile, but it's a surgical guide for crown lengthening. And it's a cool thing, it's pretty brittle. We have to find ways to make it less breakable, but it gives us a better idea, especially once we do our osseous recontouring, if I know where the margins of the future crowns would be or veneers, I know how much to retract the bone. More, more or less three millimeters, just remember the number three. And I know how much to reshape the bone. How long do we need to wait? How long do we need to wait before we do restorative treatment? Between six to eight weeks. Okay, don't do it shorter. Sometimes waiting longer is not a bad thing, especially if the tissue still matures. But we found six to eight weeks is quite adequate. And if it's not healing properly, then you need to look into why. Maybe you didn't remove enough bone. Maybe you didn't reshape the bone enough. Sometimes we need to go back and do a little bit of fine tuning. Okay, so let's look at this patient. Nice patient referred to me actually by Dr. Levitt here a couple years back in the, in the good old times, 15 years ago. But she was referred because of a non-restorable primary tooth. Okay? Non-restorable with an endo problem, and she's in her mid-20s, see a large caries lesion. So we decided to extract the tooth and replace it with an implant. So she has short teeth. We think it's delayed eruption. Okay? And we're looking at the gingival margin. It looks pretty flat, there's no zenith. There's one implant that will place in the aesthetic zone. So who says the aesthetic zone is only central and laterals? The aesthetic zone can be premolars and molars. Okay, so focus on aesthetics, not just in the, what we call it, the aesthetic zone. So what type of patient is it? Anybody? 
What type of patient? Is it an old virgin, young virgin, pre-restorative, young and worn, old and worn, or an implant patient? It's, it's an implant patient. It's an implant patient. It's, it, she needs an implant. So we're combining. The type of patient is not the diagnosis, okay? That's what maybe is a little bit confusing at the moment. Uh, we, we have this lecture recorded, and, and we'll give you the recording. You may want to watch it one more time. Not because it's so great, it's because it explains in a way you've never heard before. So this is a type of patient that is an implant patient that needs tissue removed, and we have certain precautions we need to keep in mind. The diagnosis is delayed active and passive eruption. The incisal edges are not worn, there's no wear, but the teeth are short, and the gingival margin is pretty flat, pretty flat. And we can see some, some clues, like dense bone, exostosis, we'll see it in a second uh, flapped open, and we'll see what's happening here. So here's the surgical guide. Here's the first step of the procedure. Remember, there are four step, steps for a steady chronic. What are the steps? Soft tissue excision, a full thickness flap, full thickness, not partial. It has to expose the bone underneath. And when you expose the bone, you will see the very typical type of bone for delayed eruption. It's very dense. It's very irregular. There are exostosis and tori. It's very densely attached, which, which can cause sometimes complications. I'm going to show this, show this a little bit later. But the most powerful part is that the bone is in an abnormal position, abnormal. It's sitting on the CJ. It should be three millimeters apical to that. So if you resect the, the soft tissue only, and you're thinking, okay, I'm just resecting, exposing the normal crown proportion, you would be actually right on bone. And that's pretty common. So here's our CJ. The bone is practically kissing it. Can we do it with the part? Yes, you can laser off the soft tissue part. There's no problem in, that, in doing that. But you still need to reflect the flap. So uh, our philosophy is when we do our soft tissue excision, part of this incision outline is already the first step of reflecting a flap. So we don't use lasers. We don't, we don't see them valuable for a, an osseous procedure. So here's our third step, the osseous recontouring. We use different types of burrs. We move the bone apically and we reshape it. And that's where the surgical guide comes handy. Again, back on. You don't put it in the trash right away. Fit it on the teeth. It shows you where the gingival margins should be. And then you can count back three millimeters and reshape the bone. It looks like a different, but it is the same, I promise you. It just takes a little bit of understanding of how the bone needs to look like the height of bone, okay, so here's the height component, but that's where a lot of dentists fail. They just think about height, but they don't think about width or the horizontal, and the horizontal component is similar to what we did with dentures. When we carved the wax for a denture, what did we do? We did something called festooning, festooning. Okay, festooning is not because of a denture, it's because the shape of the bone. And this, the bone is concave in between the roots and convex on the roots. So we have a transition between concave convex, and that's called festooning. That has to be represented in the bone as well, right here. Here is before recontouring, very dense bone, and this is how it's supposed to look like anatomically. And you, you may look at it and say, Z, why are you taking all this good bone away? Well, if I don't take it away, if I don't make it anatomical and physiological, the, the tissue will relapse. So we just defeated the purpose. Patient went through surgery, paid all this money, had all this relative pain and suffering, and we didn't get the results. So if you don't do the right osseous recontouring, you're not going to get the result that you want. And, and I'm all for being conservative. And that's part of the procedure. And last step is the suturing. How about the implant? How about the implant? Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I've done once in 20 years is replacing a primary tooth and being fooled 
by the amount of bone. Most primary teeth have a lot of bone. Go figure. So you look at this bone platform, you just stick the implant in where the primary tooth was. What's the end result? You're getting an implant restoration that looks like a primary tooth. So it's a mistake I want you to do only once. Actually, you're, if you're not placing implants, it's not a mistake that, that you will ever make. But you may restore cases. And, and, and naturally, it happens to the best of us. So you need to be aware that you have too much bone in the vertical component. You need to actually reduce the bone with apically to bury your platform three to four millimeters below the ideal gingival margin, not, not where it's at right now, which is obviously excessive. So I need to go in there and flatten and, and this bone reduction or ridge reduction, almost always you need to do it. Almost always. And if you don't, you're going to mess up this patient for life. It's not a non-repairable problem. You can't repair it, what are you, except short of removing the implant. It's non-repairable. We, we want things that are repairable or, or not to make the mistake to begin with. So this is an implant patient with delayed eruption. Let's talk about some red flags. What are the things that you want to do and things to be aware of? And when to refuse treatment. Let me share with you one case. A very nice lady that was referred with short teeth. And I'm already looking at it. And I'm looking at, she's a young virgin with delayed eruption as a diagnosis, with a lot of attaching keratinized tissue. Right? A lot of bone, a lot of tori, a lot of exostosis. Don't forget about your radiographic exam. We need to look at x-rays. And this patient has root resorption for whatever reason. Ortho or trauma, whatever it was. That's a contraindication. But can you just remove a little bit? No, I don't. You know, I'm not doing it. I prefer if you have short teeth and no teeth. Okay, we don't want to expedite the implant process, definitely not the, in the aesthetic zone. So make sure that you're, ma you're making the right decision for the patient. As much as they'll, they'll give you a suitcase full of money, just do it. No, don't do it. You're messing them up. Okay, our goal is to preserve the teeth. Short, she's still pretty. Another red flag. That's a cool one. And I got spared by this one. So this patient came in, referred, and I want you to do an aesthetic chronic thing, one millimeter. One millimeter on number eight, match it to number nine. And I said, it very, I went through the whole process. By the way, even if you see patients, and that's another tip, that's a side note. Even if you see patients, they walk in and you, listen, we're dentists, we already can read the patient. Nothing's gonna come out from this patient. They're not gonna, it's not gonna be a good match. I still go through the exam process, the same one. Even if I think the patient will not afford it, or yes, afford it, even if they're leaving tomorrow forever. They're never going to be here again. I go through the same exam process. Okay? Very important because that's what we do. And it's, you know, this patient has, may, have, may have a spouse or a friend. So we want to do our due diligence. But you also want to listen to the patient. She wants a millimeter of improvement, which can be done. It's not a, not a difficult thing to do on one tooth. It's the same principles. But what I told her is, if I lengthen this tooth, you're still not going to be happy. Why? Because the space you have for the number eight incisor is larger than the contralateral tooth. It's larger. So either you go through ortho or we figure out with our technician or with your dentist that we will create the proper teeth proportions. I'm not going to do it. She says, yeah, it's in the plan. We're going to do some ortho. Uh, you know, here's a wax up. We're going to do it. But in the back of my mind, this was a red flag for me because this is unrealistic expectations. It's a patient that thinks that if I level those central incisors, she's going to be like out of a magazine. And that's not the case. It's not the case. And that's the worst thing. And I did it. I did it. I did the surgery and it was uh, pretty successful. But the patient was very disappointed and it led to a lot of bad things. I was spared. I mean, I, the, the one thing she told me is, you're the only one who listened to me. She really left the dentist and all, and all of that. It was a bad case to treat. But listen to your patients. If, they feel, if you feel you know, you're not going to make them happy, even if you do the chronic thing, it's not going to help, don't do it. 
Let me share with you a couple of complications that can happen during, during a procedure. Now, in aesthetic conditioning, the third step, or the second step rather, is full thickness flap. Th this tissue is so dense and so irregular with a lot of undercuts and tori, and if you ever reflected the flap around the torus, it can take half an hour. Because if, you know, one wrong movement, you're going to tear the tissue. And sometimes even in, with the best of efforts, you can have some perforations because the bone is that, that dense. You see those shelves, shelves of bone. You need to undermine them and, 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 and go around them without tearing. But sometimes the tissue is scarred and you can get a tear. Okay? As periodontists, you know, we don't freak out. We, we don't have this... Um, emotion of freaking out at all. It doesn't exist. But it's a certainly a problem that we need to be aware of. So even with careful management, you can have a perforation in the most critical part. And we know what perforation means. Perforation means compromised vascularity and, and white tissue and dead flaps and necrosis. We don't like that. So careful management with proper suturing and suturing the perforations. And they all heal. They all heal if you manage them properly. Okay? Now, if you have a complete perforation of the flap, like almost like a complete tear, then you have to treat it like a vertical releasing incision, which is also not great. Because when you make incisions, you want to be in control. You don't want the tissue or the complication to determine how big your flap or how small your flap would be and where you make a vertical. So these things can happen, but ultimately a nice result. Another type of complication, and that, you know, it's a little bit scary if it happens, is for certain patients where you need to do a lot of osseous because they have those mountains of bone, you need to do a lot of osseous and you have a frenum that pulls on the tissue. And they have a type of tissue that looks very spongy. It's very brittle. It's friable. It just tears. You can have a situation where the tissue will die back and you get recession. Oh my god. Not a good thing. It's like over crown lengthening unintentionally on one tooth. Not a good thing. Okay? So we have the skills to graft. Okay, so you have to have in your surgical toolbox all the types of procedures. Everything needs to be available to you. Like in your restorative toolbox, you know how to prep for a crown and you know how to do this and that. Same thing with us. We need to find solutions because we're not going to leave a patient uh, completely messed up. Not, not going to happen. So soft tissue graft, correcting the problem, letting it heal, and then I took care of the frenum a little bit later. I don't want the tissue to pull. And I also reshaped the gum tissue. So it's not so irregular and bubbly. It's more, it's more flat and nice. And this patient was laid on, restored, and treated. And Mitch, I think this is your patient as well. And I think he's a rabbi. <laughs> I know he's a rabbi. Okay. So these things can happen, and these things need to be managed in the best possible way. So you don't have to accept tissue excess and tissue asymmetry. When you see your patients for a consultation or you know, throughout your career or throughout your week, you don't have to accept the tissue to where it's at. If they have too much tissue or the tissue is asymmetrical, you now know what types of patients can benefit from tissue reduction and bone reduction. You know what types of diagnoses exist. You know how to communicate with them, the system I shared with you. And you know the four steps of crown lengthening. You don't have to accept if a patient comes in and wants to have improvement. This is Dr. Zweig's patient from a couple years back. You don't have to accept the tissue level. And, and Dr. Zweig did not accept this tissue level. He told the patient, I'm not going to restore you as it is. That would be the easiest thing for me, for me, but you won't be happy. We need to change the tissue level. We need to create some tissue symmetry, and we need to change the color if it bothers you. If it bothers you. 
So we went through the diagnostic process. We did the crown lengthening, the four steps of crown lengthening. And we need to wait how long? Six to eight weeks. And I call this phase the ugly duckling stage. The ugly, everybody knows the story of ugly duckling? Okay, that eventually became a beautiful swan. So the ugly duckling stage is when they walk around with their old restoration. Now, if the tissue heals well, you can go back two weeks later, maybe reprovisionalize, not too, not subgingival, but you can mask it. But it's a temporary phase where they need to heal. You need to assess the symmetry until the time comes for a final restoration. So if you know all those patient, type, patient types and the diagnoses and the communication steps and the process needed to create tissue symmetry and aesthetic tissue, most of your patients can become swans. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope everybody's enjoying their meal. I'm going to have mine a little bit later at home. Very well done. Uh, uh, well done? You like it well done? Well, I, no, I say oh. it's, it's well done, good. as in good. Good. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to entertain some questions, and we have some questions from the online. Yeah. Dr. Riman. If we trim the tissue to the base of the sulcus without removing bone, what's the probability of it growing back? So uh, if we trim the tissue to the base of the sulcus without removing bone, what's the probability of it coming back? So if you trim the tissue to the base of the sulcus without trimming bone, the probability of the tissue growing back is close to 100%. And it depends on the shape of the bone, the, mostly the thickness. The thicker it is, the, light, the more likely it is to relapse. So that's one of the biggest problems. Now sometimes you can get away with just soft tissue reduction if you have a dehiscence or you have very, very thin bone that will naturally resorb with time, you can get away with gingivectomies, lasers, and things like that. But the thing is, you don't know. I hope that in this presentation, I showed you what's hiding underneath. Okay. Any more questions? Do you ever do cases where the temporaries are fabricated prior to surgery? Desired result, desired okay. margin. Okay, so the question is, is, do I ever use prefabricated temporaries that are delivered at the time of surgery? Uh, I personally don't. I don't see great value in that. Although there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I just don't see uh, the reason to do it. I don't see the reason to do it. So, so you never will have sensitivity on like three millimeters exposed. Okay, so the question was, so won't you have sensitivity? Well, depending on the diagnosis. If we're doing aesthetic crown lengthening for a patient that has delayed eruption, we're exposing enamel, so the sensitivity will be minimal. If we're doing it on compensatory eruption, we have to warn them about sensitivity and maybe desensitize and maybe restore them. But I, I don't like to place my provisionals at the time of surgery. Unless they already have provisionals, for whatever reason, I, don't, I, do, I personally don't do it. Any questions from this table? More questions, yes. Okay, so question. Do exostosis ever grow back? I don't know, maybe. May I don't see them. I don't see them, but Usually when you remove them, and we don't really know why exostosis are formed. We assume it's something to do with occlusion, but we don't really know that. We don't, we don't know that. So I, I personally don't see them grow back, but they may. They may. Great question. You have a question? Question? You wanted to ask something? Yeah. So, um, What's your thoughts on deep margin elevation versus crown lengthening? Beautiful. So question about deep margin elevation. Uh, deep margin elevation relates 
mostly to the non-aesthetic area. In the interproximal, where a caries or fracture extended in an area where we would normally do a functional crown lengthening. And uh, the person that developed that or is a, is a big proponent of it is uh, Pascal Manier. And basically what it does under strict isolation, it builds up the tooth structure and creates its margin on the buildup. And that requires meticulous restorative work and, and, I, and it works well. Actually my wife had that. And we didn't do any crown lengthening, so it does, it does work well. But it just requires uh, training on how to do this and, and definitely isolation because if you don't isolate and retract and moisture control properly, then your whole margin elevation is going to fail, not, if not in the short term, in the long term. Question over there. Just if you can speak up a little bit. Great question, and it actually was studied by Kokic, Kokic Jr. They did a lot of studies on what's perceived as anesthetic in, in terms of gingival display. And they figured out that for most people, a gingival display of over four millimeters is considered anesthetic, unless you're an orthodontist. They figured out the orthodontist at two millimeters they don't like the way it looks. And, and, and it was a very well-designed study. It's actually a classical uh, study in our literature. Uh, however, and, and that's, that's a great starting point, but you could have a patient with one millimeter of gingival display who is, uh, is unhappy, and somebody with six that couldn't care less. So always go back to the patient and figure out what bothers them. Because our, our treatments are, I call them a la carte. They're custom. We're going to stay away from templates, from all sorts of DSDs and things like, nothing wrong with DSD, but you can't fall into the templates. You've got to give your patient the unique smile they, they want. And I like the proportion gauge and the golden proportion, but we really stay away from it. And, and that's coming not from a, a, a restorative or somebody that uh, deals with restorative, but I deal with restorative dentists and I see the results. Mark. Do you prepare the patients for the unpredictability of healing? Okay, if I prepare, do I prepare the patient for the unpredictability of healing? I'd like to think that healing is very predictable. So we know very well what is most likely. We're talking just about the steady crown lengthening, this type of procedure. This is one of the most predictable procedures uh, there is. Now, is there a patient that one out of a hundred that will develop an infection? or will have relapse, or will get one of those complications, yes. I do prepare them, and I talk, from, I talk to them from, uh, about what's most com commonly seen, the swelling, the pain, discomfort, the sensitivity, to the most rare infections, tissue recession, your jaw breaking, I mean, all of that is in the consent, but... The you know, I'm talking about the, the perhaps the, the lack of precision of number eight, Beautiful. So here's, 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 that, that's, I'm glad you sharpened the question. So yes, I do, I do prepare them. So I prepare them in a sense that I tell them I, I will aim, I will aim to the idea, for, for the ideal. Total symmetry between eight and nine, total symmetry between the laterals and the canines. Now, patient's healing can vary. That's talking to the patient. And should you have a discrepancy, I will go back in there at no additional cost to you to refine it. And sometimes we need to do it. And that's the preparation. And they're like, cool, I don't have to pay again for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. They trust you already at this point. But it's good to talk about it, 100%. Stephen. Okay, great question. Can you do orthodontics before aesthetic crawling lengthening? You can, but here's the problem, and I've done it both ways. Here's the problem. When you do a perform aesthetic crawling lengthening before ortho, your teeth are malpositioned. Your roots are malpositioned. 
So you have to follow the anatomy of the tooth. And it's doable. But what if a tooth is rotated slightly? You don't have great access. So at least get them to a point where they're more or less in a nice arch form. So you, you know, it sets you up for success with the procedure. So I recommend it afterwards. That's case by case. I don't, I don't have the exact number. The, and, and nor do I know enough about orthodontics in terms of you know, the, the, the time frames and what needs to be done. But it's, they need to be more or less in, in, a, in a nice arch form where the buckle of the, root, the roots and the teeth are more or less aligned and they're fickle. And they're not severely rotated. Because then you don't have surgical access and, and you'll compromise the results. And we want them to do it all. 